Good evening. I'm Monica McCain Sanchez, and this is CB8 Speaks. Tonight's guest is William T. Castro, who is the Manhattan Borough Commissioner of Parks. Commissioner Castro has been in the position of parks for Manhattan since 2002. Prior to that, he was with the Bronx Parks area, and he has been with New York City Parks since 1982, and along the way, he earned his master's in public administration from Harvard University. Thank you. Nice to be here. Let's get started. What led you to have a career in the Parks Department to begin with? Well, I had been working in uh, the New York City Council uh, for a great councilman, Tony Olivieri, mm -hmm. and uh, he passed away, and his best friend, Gordon Davis, was the Parks Commissioner, mm -hmm. and he asked me to come to Parks. Um, this was in 1981, and um, I had thought of it as being, well, maybe not the greatest, uh, best place to go if they wanted to do innovative things, but turned out it was the place to be. Mm -hmm. uh, the Commissioner was very innovative, a lot going on, Parks Department is a very interesting place to work in because it's so diverse. There's so many different things you get involved with. You learn so much. And what I like about it and why I got interested in government and politics to begin with is you can help people. You can be part of where things are uh, happening and, and make improvements. And over the years, I found that the Parks Department provides a lot of opportunities to, to help people and, and to improve things. Well, it certainly is an important area of life for everybody in New York City. What's the relationship between the Parks Department and the conservancies in New York City? Well, it's a very good relationship. The various friends groups and conservancies that have sprung up over the last 30 years or so uh, provide uh, extra funding, extra involvement um, in some of our major parks. Everyone knows about the Central Park Conservancy, obviously, in Central Park, the premier one. They provide over $24 million a year. Um, to the park for everything from capital improvements to staffing. Uh, the city also provides uh, funding um, over $10 million every year to assist in that, and, and we're involved in the, some of the management of it. But by and large, the Conservancy uh, is responsible for most of the planning and management of the park. So everybody knows about that. But what they don't know about necessarily, uh, unless you live in Community Board 8, is we have a great local conservancy, um, community-based, um, the Carl Schurz Park Conservancy. It's a very well-run group. Uh, they raise uh, not $24 million every year, but they, they raise uh, several hundred thousand a year. And they are very involved in one of the most, I think, beautiful parks in the city of New York, Carl Schurz Park. It has multi-levels. It's a beautiful uh, landscaping. And they do programming. They have 17 zone gardeners who are volunteers, um, over 2,000 hours of volunteerism every year. And they do a lot of great programming. And that's the thing with conservancies, uh, Madison Square Conservancy, Battery Conservancy, Riverside Park. They supplement what Parks does, and some eventually raise funds enough so they can do most of the staffing. And that allows us to use staff in other parts of the city uh, instead of having to devote it just to those parks. So it's a partnership. It works very well. And recently, Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner um, Silver worked with the conservancies, several of them, to provide about $15 million worth of services to parks in other neighborhoods, everything from landscaping to training to programming and over the next three years. And that's something that uh, a lot of people will benefit from. And it's uh, part of our partnership. Parks is sort of uh, uniquely positioned among all city agencies to work not just with the community, but with the business community to make parks better. Uh, you can partner up with different groups and individuals, and uh, so that's what we're doing. Wow. You were the parks commissioner in the Bronx before you came to Manhattan. There must be a world of difference between the kinds of parks they have up there and what exists in Manhattan. Well, it's, it is interesting. I was there for about seven years, and uh, the Bronx has some wonderful parks. Uh, Pelham Bay Park in the northeast part of the Bronx is the, the city's largest park. Mm -hmm. uh, it's where Orchard Beach is and uh, beautiful woodlands. Uh, there was the 1960 Olympic rowing trials there. Uh, most people don't know that, and you can still row there. And Van Cortlandt Park, where one of the oldest uh, existing uh, houses uh, predating the American Revolution is. Um, New York, in Manhattan, you have uh, a lot of more well-known historic parks, but the management of the two boroughs is essentially the same. It's very similar. Uh, most people are, have their neighborhood parks and playgrounds. 
Uh, most people want uh, to volunteer and get involved in their local park, which we work with them through our Partnerships for Parks program. We give technical support. We organize events, everything from, you know, your classic uh, cleanup to planting uh, tulip bulbs. Uh, we do a lot with them. That's the other good thing about parks. Individuals can get involved and make a big difference mm -hmm. in their local park. And even in advocating, uh, a, it doesn't have to be a big organized group or a conservancy. It can be an individual who wants to write letters and, and suggest ideas and get involved. Our local elected officials will listen to them, and so will the parks commissioner. And we work together with them to make the parks better. So I would say, in, in essence, though there are differences, the boroughs are very similar in how you approach the management of the park system. Is there anything unique about the parks in Community District 8 compared to other areas of Manhattan? Well, yes, it's an interesting district. We're bordered by Central Park on the west, which is a wonderful park, and mm -hmm. people should uh, take advantage of it whenever they can. It's, it's for everyone, and the people on, in Board 8 are very fortunate to have it so close by. Um, we also have the East River Esplanade that we're doing a lot of work on over the last few years, and it's accelerating now to improve it. And people should also take advantage to walk along the East River and the Harlem River. It's a beautiful experience, and uh, we're working with uh, Councilman Kalos and uh, the Speaker uh, Melissa Mark Viverito, and of course the mayor, to get additional funds there. And then there's just the beautiful Carlshers Park, and we have our mayor who's living there, mm -hmm. which is a nice thing too. And so that's sort of the most unique thing that uh, the mayor of the city of New York lives in one of our parks here on uh, Community Board 8. Yeah. Talking about a very unique park, there is a park called the Queensboro Oval Park, which is underneath the Queensboro Bridge, and it was set aside as a park, as a playground in 1909. And for 30 years, there's been a private tennis club that has been, I guess, renting the land from Parks Department to have, for six months of the year, an enclosed tennis bubble. And the lease is set to expire in 2017, and uh, Community Board 8 has had a number of hearings and meetings about the condition that that oval is left in once that, te that tennis bubble comes down mm -hmm. and has actually asked that the oval be returned to full-time, 12 months a year public use. And it's actually, you know, uh, there is a famous photo of Joe Namath playing softball <laughs> under the bridge, if people can Google that. What's the current position of the parks about the use of that land? Right. It's a tennis bubble that allows people in the wintertime and the fall and spring to play tennis. And it's a, it's a public, uh, it's, it's privately run, but it's for the public. That's why we do these concessions. Uh, it saves the city money and actually brings in revenue to the city, which, of course, we always need money to pay for teachers and parks people and police and, uh, and what have you. The issue is whether or not... Um, people want to have the tennis bubble there. It, it, the license expires. It's not a lease exactly, it's a license. And okay. it allows, uh, it ends in 2017. Mm -hmm. So about a year before. So this year, okay. we'll be going back to the community board and to the community at large and saying, uh, all right, well, it's up for renewal, uh, for rebidding, rather. Mm -hmm. And what are your ideas for this park? And there are benefits from the tennis bubble. Mm -hmm. um, it provides people with uh, tennis uh, to be played there, but there are other things we can also do in the park. And so mm -hmm. we're going to take a serious discussion to look at this with the community mm -hmm. and come to a decision uh, as to how to go forward. And we're very open-minded about it at this point. Okay. Now, there's also a new project that was just recently announced, Parks Without Borders, mm -hmm. and it allows New Yorkers to nominate parks for renovation to be more accessible. Can you describe what that program is all about? Sure. It's, it's a great program. I'm very excited about it. And Commissioner uh, Mitchell Silver, uh, really, uh, it's his vision. It's what he wants to do, and, and I'm very enthusiastic. We all are. The idea is to make a park connect with the community more. And there are a number of ways that can be done through design. Uh, sometimes you have a high fence that maybe was put in years ago for whatever reason, because that was always the way parks had fences. And you really don't need that fence anymore. And the benefit of that, or you have high shrubbery, um, um, or you're not, it just doesn't relate out. Mm. If you take down the fence or lower the fence, or you create some additional entrances or widen entrances, by thinking what is it that the community wants and what makes it more accessible, it really opens up the park 
to, to, it makes it sort of like an open house, an open door to the community rather than sort of a wall. Mm -hmm. And that's in part what the commissioner is trying to do. Also, what he, he wants to do is put more amenities out onto the perimeter and the sidewalk where people will feel a sense of being invited to use it so that it's not just a sidewalk, but there may be additional plant beds, which really look beautiful. And we've done some of this, and, and it's really going to accelerate. Or there may be tables and chairs or other sitting areas, other amenities, or the way it's a more interesting sidewalk than just concrete. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing, the, Mayor de Blasio worked with the Commissioner Silver to put in $50 million from the city budget for this project, which will allow us to pick eight parks to totally renovate as part of this program, Parks Without Borders. And people can give us suggestions for parks they think might be good candidates for this. Mm -hmm and they can go to the parks website www.nyc.gov slash parks and then slash pwb for parks without borders and people can log on to that and give us their suggestions uh... they can also go through the community boards with their suggestions as well so that would be a good idea mm -hmm. the other thing we're doing aside from that is uh... we're already taking this design concept that the commissioner has and putting it into existing already funded capital projects to see where we can pare down fences or lower them or make them more inviting in the perimeter. And uh, it's very exciting. Commissioner Silver is a, an architect um, and a city planner. And so he has a lot of great ideas of how to uh, make parks more welcoming and more integrated into the community. Is there any issue that might be uh, related to security concerns? For instance, at nighttime, right. it's really not a good idea to be hanging around any park with making it more accessible? Has, is there any thought on that issue? Yeah, we're very mm -hmm. mindful of that. And you want to make sure that it's uh, appropriate to how it's being used. Um, we close parks, uh, many large parks, Central Park, for example. We don't put gates there. Um, and it just closes at 1 AM. Other parks close at other hours that don't have gates or, or fencing, per se. So uh, that can be addressed if there is a problem. But we're going to work it out. Uh, we are aware of that, and we're going to see where it's most appropriate. There's a rather new park for uh, Community Board 8, which is in at East 63rd Street and East River, called Andrew Haswell Green. And it's been uh, slowly getting more and more improvements. And I was wondering if you have an update on future improvements that are anticipated for that park. Yes, it's, uh, we're very proud of it. And this is really uh, a very important new park for Community Board 8 residents. Um, uh, several years ago, we did the first phase where we uh, redid the sea rail, new paving, new pathway, and put in a dog run, plantings. It's really a beautiful part of, of the park system. What we're going to do uh, now, it's actually in construction, started this summer. There is an old building that used to be part of the Department of Sanitation where they brought garbage in and to load onto barges then became a heliport. Most people know of it as from when it was a heliport. And now we're renovating uh, the top of it for a lawn area and sitting area. The next phase will be to build a lawn and a sloping lawn coming down from that, down to the main promenade. But first we have to renovate the uh, pilings that support it. We did a study and found that a number of them were deteriorating. So we have $25 million to do all of that. And that will happen over the next year or two. Uh, actually over the next several years and that's a major project but it'll make it safe for the future and it will totally renovate and add the lawns as I described um, and so within the next several years uh, people here in the community are going to see expanded parkland um, at the location and it's right along the water it's really quite beautiful it's a beautiful pedestrian bridge that goes over it. and then it links you right up through the rest of the esplanade mm -hmm. And uh, let's talk more about the Esplanade. Okay. Now, Rockefeller University and the Hospital for Special Surgery are funding parts of the restoration. And as you mentioned, it really is spectacular. I mean, it really, if people are watching this program who have never been there, you really have to do it. Only a few entry points to it, but you're right up against the water's edge. It comes almost right up to the, the edge, and it's just uh, an incredible feeling walking there but it's got a lot of issues with it. So I wanted to see if you could mention what are the most urgent projects that have to be tackled with that. I mean, there's a lot going on with it. That's right, and several years ago, uh, 
the, uh, the city um, and the Parks Department primarily uh, undertook uh, an engineering study of the entire esplanade <clears throat> um, all the way up to 124th Street. And they found, uh, it's really kind of interesting, and we've, we worked with a task force that uh, former council member Jessica Lappin and Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney co-chaired and now uh, Councilman Ben Kalos co-chairs. And it allowed us to, with engineers, to look at the condition, the structural condition. And what we found basically was that over the years, the water washes in. <clears throat> and there are two main types of support. One are just these sort of like pilings that you see under an old pier if you went out to the, the, the shore. And others are, are a gravity wall um, of stone uh, walls. And the water just comes in, and it undermines the soil uh, underneath the promenade or the esplanade. And what we've done over the last few years, working with the Department of Transportation um, and Parks and Con Edison, working all in this interagency task force and DEP, uh, we've worked to repair a number of the sinkholes that started to develop from the water coming in and undermining it. What's even more exciting is uh, two things. Uh, one, we have a uh, $15 million project that Speaker Viverito funded uh, three million of, and then Mayor de Blasio funded the rest. And what we're doing is we're going to hit about five locations uh, in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and in, at 91st Street to repair the seawall area and the, uh, the area of undermining. Then we have another $25 million project that will start in a couple of years to do additional sites. Um, the exciting thing about Rockefeller is they're committing their own money to renovate a portion of that. And Councilman Kalos has been really a leader in working with Rockefeller University to get them to agree to not just renovate um, from 63rd Street up to 68th Street, but also to pay for the maintenance of it, the annual maintenance of staff to clean it and maintain it. Um, that's going to make a major contribution uh, to the area, and we really applaud Rockefeller University and Councilman Kalos for doing that. They also have uh, gotten involved in helping to fund a conservancy small group working to help maintain um, <clears throat> and program, mostly program, certain aspects of, of it, and we're working with them on that, and we're going to be working further with the speaker on some other areas uh, in her district. So it's, it's gathering momentum. Uh, we're, we're doing not only the physical improvement, um, with the mayor's funding and with uh, working with local institutions like Rockefeller and the Hospital for Special Surgery is also getting involved to help maintain 70th to 72nd. Um, and now we're going to be working with other institutions. Uh, I was just talking to Asphalt Green, another institution here providing great programs for people uh, in this area to work on programming uh, ideas for that, that area in the 90s. Um, so we're very happy about that and we're looking forward to it. I know everyone is um, very excited about the changes coming on that. Now, there is a, an, uh, a lot on 2nd Avenue and 63rd Street that uh, the people in the community board refer to as 1190 2nd Avenue, which is right now, it's being used by the MTA to facilitate construction east side access, which is going to connect the Long Island Railroad to uh, Grand Central. And that, that project isn't going to be finished until 2022, but right. apparently the, that lot is available for development uh, or will be freed up, I would should say, mm -hmm. around 2018. And um, the community board has spoken and, and indicated that they would like that to be converged parkland. And have any plans for that location that you can share with us? We don't have any plans. Um, Are you thinking about it? <laughs> and as, as they say, we don't have any plans to have plans at the moment. Oh. We have been in conversations with the MTA, mm -hmm. and um, our planning division has. We know that the MTA has facilities underneath that lot for the support of that, uh, that system. And as you said, they're, they're not planning to be out of there until 2020, 2022, something along those lines. So we'll see as it gets closer um, whether or not that happens. I mean, we, and we've had experience with things like this in other areas. Um, so we'll see. Um, we're always interested in parkland. Mm -hmm. um, but. I don't know whether this will work out. It, it just, you know, we'll have to see what the MTAs, because they have a lot of structures there and needs, and it may not happen. So we'll just have to see. There's a chance that they might continue to utilize it or? Well, they will be using it yeah. uh, th through 2020, 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll just have to see whether that opportunity presents itself. It's mm -hmm. a little too early to, to tell. 
Well, I'm personally interested in it because I live very close to okay. that. Right. And we've seen it going <laughs> through many, many iterations. And uh, yes. right now it's not particularly attractive. <laughs> so uh, if it turns into a park, that would be terrific. Going a little further uptown, John Jay Park, mm -hmm. which is at the FDR between 76th and 78th Street, has some basketball courts there which are of concern to the community board. They have been in some, somewhat disrepair and um, particularly there is an issue of a lack of accessibility for disabled residents at the main entrance and the use of the water fountain. Uh, there's also poor drainage, broken pavement, dilapidated benches and fences, um, and just some general um, uh, aesthetics, I should say, no mm -hmm. nets on the basketball hoops, although there are a lot of neighborhoods, I think, <laughs> have, or at least when I was growing up, generally the nets got ripped down. Right. Have you looked into that particular park and those issues? Yes, you know, it's it's sort of the story of there's always one more thing to do, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I, the reason I say that, we've, we've spent um, millions of dollars in John Jay Park, renovating the, the field house there, with new bathrooms, ADA accessible uh, facilities there with a new elevator, a community room that we have senior programming in and renovated the entire playground. But this is one area that's sort of the last thing to get to. And uh, as they say, Rome wasn't built in a day, so we're getting there. Rome is almost going to be finished in terms of John Jay. And it does need it, and there are cracks in the asphalt. I played softball there many years ago, and um, I, I don't think it's been re renovated since that time, that, that area. So we, we are developing a budget for it. We'll be working with Councilman Kalos on that. And you're right, it does need improvement. Um, we don't tend to put nets on uh, the baskets anymore. Um, sometimes we do, we try it. Um, um, it's not really feasible in terms of the, the, the wear and tear that happens, but you know, Maybe we'll look at that. We could certainly look to, in the meantime, improve the backboards, and I will look into that to see if we can put some of the um, plexiglass backboards that have become very popular in the meantime. But yes, it does need improvement, but we're working to do that. That's great. Another park uptown, Rupert, 2nd Avenue, 90th Street. The, the board has uh, um, been concerned about reports of rodent infestation, excessive garbage, uh, there's concern for the plantings there, mm -hmm. and the need for a dog run. Um, and a representative of the parks had met with the Community Board 8 Parks Committee in November to hear the issues, and we're wondering if any ha action's been taken since November. Yeah, rodent issues are uh, a problem in some parks, and, it, and typically the, the reason is not so much the garbage in the park, although that certainly can be the reason, and rats don't need very much um, to live on, and it can actually explode a, uh, into a, a, a lot of rats occupying that park. We work very closely with the Department of Health. They've been terrific. And they're very expert, and they've, they've consulted with us on Rupert on how various strategies, how many trash cans, uh, for example, to, to put, where should you put them, where should you put the, the bait stations, um, uh, how else to disrupt. So uh, some of us and the managers have become uh, sort of a little bit of experts in this and dealing with this, and they've been very helpful in doing that. So we've, we've baited, we've increased the baiting schedule. We'll be baiting it every month and if necessary, every two weeks, but every month. We're gonna need help in, um, uh, and our park enforcement patrol will come in and monitor and see if we can persuade the person who's uh, feeding the pigeons to stop that. That is one of the prime reasons. And the other things you can do are make sure you increase your collection of garbage and so it doesn't stay overnight or, or have sort of rat resistant containers that have lids on them. So I'll look at that as well. But it's a well-maintained park. The problem is it's on a slope. There are sort of four main panels of uh, grass that get eroded very quickly because of that. And people have been bringing their dogs in and using those sometimes, and I understand that happens. So whether or not a dog run should go in, we're gonna work with the community board on that. I always like to get the advice of the community board, and particularly about dog runs, whether they think it's advisable or not. And I'll be meeting with the friends group as well in a couple of weeks to see uh, some of their ideas on this. Um, it's a beautiful park, actually, and there were some renovations done um, back in the 90s, and what I'd like to see is the good work that the Friends group is doing, um, and there's some groups, there was a Muslim group, there was another church group, painted the fencing, which looks great. It needs some renovation in terms of the plant beds, um, so, but it's all stuff that can be done, doesn't, and we're putting in $100,000 worth of irrigation this spring, 
um, and that's going to make a, uh, a, a, it'll be very supportive of any plantings we do and of the lawns, and that'll make a big difference in the lawns and how they look. That should. Well, with the, the last few moments we have left, um, can you talk about any future vision you have for parks? Um, Community Board 8, we're, we're very focused on our area, but anything you can speak to about philosophy or strategy for the future parks in Manhattan? The key for people is to, uh, one, be aware of the parks that they have. And the Parks Department is going to work with the community board and community organizations to get the word out on, on the great parks that they have immediately in, in the community, but also not that far away um, that have really great programs. And, and, and also the, the recreation centers. For example, the 54th Street Recreation Center, which is just a few blocks uh, from Community Board 8, has a lot of great programs, has a swimming pool, it has basketball courts, fitness center, and it's it's so much cheaper than a, a conventional uh, private facility. Uh, it's really worth taking a look at. So we're going to get the word out more on that. The other thing we're going to do is program parks more. Uh, I'm very uh, excited about John Jay Park and what we can do for seniors and for just everyone in that facility that we renovated. It's meant to be used during the school year primarily for programming, and, and we do have funding that Councilman Kalos provided uh, for programming uh, for seniors. I want to expand that for all ages. Uh, there's a, an outdoor swimming pool there, and there's a lot of great programming that can happen there. And then the Andrew Haswell Green renovation as that continues. But the biggest thing, I, I think, and, and we're renovating parks in the area, I think the most important thing is for the community to get involved. The more people volunteer, and it can be just, you know, once in a while, and some people, they want to do it all the time, and that's great too. Carl Schurz Park has done a great job in enlisting people to volunteer every week, in many cases, to, to help garden and maintain the landscape. Parks can't do it alone. We can do a lot. But the more the community gets involved, sees something wrong or wants corrected and lets us know, that galvanizes us and, and brings a partnership together where we sort of, uh, it's synergistic as they say, it really multiplies the amount of effort um, or the amount of work that you can get done when you're working together. And we like to have ideas. Ideas from the public are very important and we can make a lot of improvements so, and work with the elected officials. So I see uh, the parks really improving significantly with more park opportunities for the community in the, in the next few years, and we're very happy to be a part of that. Well, thank you, Commissioner, for being here. This is really fantastic to hear from you about the great things that you're doing for Community Board 8's parks. Well, thank you for inviting me. Right, good night, everybody.